Good morning, Baker Chapel. Good morning, good morning Carissa. Carissa. It is so good to see you on this Sunday morning. If you are able, would you please stand and join us for our opening song? Good morning. good morning. It is really good to see you here this morning. You may be seated for just a couple of announcements. Uh, it is just great. We were back there praying before the service and uh, just appreciating how God works and how the, the church really is not easily conquered and how we are slowly building back and God is, is doing a new thing through you and through us and, and through his church. And if you're watching us from home, uh, welcome. We're glad you're with us uh, here this morning. And just know that if you don't have a church family, that you're invited to come and uh, be a part of our church family. When you feel it's right, come on in and worship with us right here in the sanctuary, okay? I'm going to spring something on you guys, and a lot of you are going to be surprised by this, but I'm going to ask for your help. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there's something I've been wanting to do for years, and I finally put it on my calendar for October 3rd. And what I want to do, if I can get the help from some of you, is to do a blessing of the animals. And so I'm looking at the Brewsters, and I'm looking at the Lewises, and I'm looking at Paul Funk. Is Paul Funk here today? And, and any of you with cats and dogs? There is a liturgy for it. I didn't make this up, okay? So it's a thing that happens, and it always happens in October. So after worship today, if you would be interested in helping me put together a service for October 3rd, and if we can't pull it off by then, maybe we can do it later, but we don't want it to get too much later, or we're going to run into some bad weather. But think about that this morning, and uh, again, after the service, uh, if you want to help me figure that out and how we might pull that off, I think it would be a wonderful time uh, to do a blessing uh, of our animals, okay? Would you stand now and greet one another with the peace of Christ and then remain standing for the call to worship? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcome to worship here at Baker Chapel. The presence of the risen Christ is with us this morning. He's made that promise that when we gather in his name, he's here, and so he's here uh, by his Spirit. Sometimes we don't feel it, but that doesn't mean it isn't here. 
our prayer, of course, is that as we worship this morning, through the singing or through the praying or through the preaching or through your interaction with one another, that the Spirit will show up in a powerful way and you'll be blessed and we will worship. Okay, let's sing. Would you please pray with us? Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be here to praise and to worship you, and I just thank you for this church service and for sending your son, Jesus, for us. I pray, Lord, during Pastor Randy's message and during Miss Melody's um, message that you would open our hearts and open our ears, and we would be open to the message we need to receive today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and the children are invited to come forward now for the children's message as we scan the pews for one child. We had one child last week, Melody. We got a bunch of children out there, I bet.
Well, good morning, kiddos. I wasn't here last Sunday. And I have to admit, I don't have a good reason, except I was tired. I was tired and I needed to rest. And I, Pastor Randy called me last Sunday morning and I felt so guilty talking to him because I was just tired and I just wanted to go back to sleep. And as I thought about that all week long, about Wednesday, when I was really tired, this came to me. And it's from Genesis, the story of creation. And in chapter 2, verse 2, it says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And I got to thinking about the last few weeks, and we've been studying Mark, and Jesus had been busy, busy, busy. He'd been healing people. He'd been preaching. He'd been teaching. He was trying to get away from people even just because he was so tired he needed to rest. And I thought, God needed to rest. Jesus needed to rest. And I'm feeling guilty because I needed to rest. You know, physically, our bodies need rest. Our brains need rest. Our heart needs rest. We need to rest. And sometimes we get so busy in the world that we forget to rest. And a lot of you kiddos are back to school, whether it's grade school or preschool. And so you get up early and you go to school and you come home and you might have soccer practice or softball practice or baseball practice or karate or whatever. And then you come home and you've got to get your homework done. You've got to eat supper. You've got to get your bath. And you're getting to bed and you're just exhausted. And we're forgetting to take time to rest, to let our bodies rest. And I think it's in that time that I rest that I really hear God talking to me. And I want that for you. I want you to have time to rest. And I know kids like to play, but believe it or not, sometimes playing is your rest. Um, and sometimes it's just crawling up with your pillow and your blanket on the couch and just being really quiet and letting your body rest. And that's when you can hear God talking to you. And I've had a, a really exciting, busy couple of weeks. Um, and when I took that time last Sunday, I still watched Pastor Randy and I still watched church, but I just kind of laid there in bed and relaxed and I just felt so much better when I got up. So here's what I want for you this week. <clears throat> this week, I want you to take some time to rest. Get your homework done, because you know I'm a teacher first. Get your homework done. But I want you to take some time to just let your body relax and rest and have some fun and enjoy life and know that even God rested. So it's okay. It's okay to rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your example to us of knowing that, yes, there's a lot to do. We're busy, but it's important to take time to rest. We ask that um, you just watch over our children. Lord, put a hedge of protection around them. This virus is attacking our kids. And, and Lord, we just pray that you keep our, our kiddos safe. Um, we ask that you be with them at school, be with them um, when they're out in public, and just protect them. Um, we ask you to, to let their little bodies and minds rest and recuperate and relax. And Lord, we thank you for each and every one of them and can't wait to see them back here. Just protect them, bless them, watch over them. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, amen.
It is the tradition in the church to stand out of respect for the gospel, and so if you're able, please stand. We are still in the book of Mark. It is the year of Mark. This morning we're in chapter 9 of Mark. Jesus and his disciples are making their way to Jerusalem. The ninth chapter, beginning with the 30th verse. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is good to be in your temple, among your people, in the presence of your spirit, and your word, the body, and the blood. Lord, take a hold of my tongue and, and my lips, and my mind and my heart. Take a hold of our people's minds and hearts, and speak. May them words from my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your side as we strive to understand what can sometimes seem so hard to understand. Come Holy Spirit and speak. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I suggested to all of you that it would be a great idea to do something that I had just done not that long ago. And that is to take the Gospel of Mark and to read it from the front to the back and to do it in one sitting. And it is possible because it's really not that long. Now, it's a good little sit, okay? You're not going to hammer it out in five minutes, but you can do it. Mark, uh, not only was it the first Gospel written, it comes second in the order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it was the first one that was written. It is the shortest by far. It's only 16 chapters. The chapters are shorter. For instance, the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, is twice as long as the Gospel of Mark. And so you can do it. If you begin at page 1 and go all the way through to the end of the Gospel of Mark, you can complete that. And it's interesting. What you'll see is that Mark wrote a story. He wrote a narrative, and so there's a narrative thread from the beginning to the end. He took all of the sources that he had those stories that were passed down about Jesus and those collections of sayings and those collections of parables, and he had all that in front of him, but he stitched it together as one story. So if you read it from the beginning to the end, you'll see that one story unfold, and you'll notice things that you've never, that you've never really noticed before. And I think you'll notice this. I noticed it. And if you haven't done it yet, Look for this. The disciples, the 12, these hand-picked dudes by Jesus, never get it. They never, ever understand. From the beginning, through the middle, to the end, the disciples never get it. The Gospel of Mark closes on the disciples' misunderstanding. It is an amazing thing because if we read in bits and pieces like we do, we take a text, right, pull it out, read it on Sunday morning, 
preach about it, think about it, pray about it. If we do that and we see that the, that the disciples are, are misunderstanding, we're like, okay, yeah, they're not, they're, it, you know, they don't understand yet, but they will someday. Someday they'll get it. They don't. Read it from the beginning to the end. The disciples, the 12, the hand-picked team of Jesus, Jesus' inner circle, they don't ever get it within the pages of the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark has been called a passion narrative with an extended introduction. Passion. Passion means suffering. This is a story about the suffering of Jesus with a long introduction to that suffering so that even the introduction is about that suffering. A passion narrative with an extended introduction. Fully one-third of the Gospel of Mark is about the last week of his life. This is a book about the passion. It is about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In this extended introduction, before we get to that last week and those last chapters of the Gospel of Mark, there are three predictions of the Passion. Three. Jesus predicts three times in front of these disciples that he is going to go to Jerusalem and die and be raised again. Three times he does it. He did it in chapter 8. He's doing it this morning in chapter 9. He's going to do it again in chapter 10. He is going to predict his death and his resurrection. But let me clarify. It is not, not so much a prediction. It is a teaching. Jesus is teaching these 12 guys. Jesus came for a purpose, and we know what that purpose was. But secondary to that purpose, and very, very important and critical to that purpose, was teaching these 12 guys. When you read it, when you go front to back, Jesus is constantly taking those 12 aside and teaching them. He'll tell a parable. Then he'll bring the disciples in and say, here's what this parable means. Yes, he's healing and he's doing all these miracles. He's doing all that stuff for the people, for the multitudes. But on his job description is to teach these guys. Why? Because Jesus with the coming of the kingdom of God, is about to execute a reversal. He is about to turn things upside down. These 12 guys are going to replace the religious leadership of Jesus' day. These 12 guys are going to sit on the 12 thrones of Israel in the new kingdom. Jesus has to teach these guys. He has to prepare these guys for it because he's going to use them. They're not getting it, but he's going to use these guys. That's his purpose. He is there to teach, to teach. His teaching is so important. I have never felt more strongly about my own preaching that it has to be expository. There's another big church word, right? We talked last week that church loves big words. Expository means teaching. And the way I've been taught to preach over these last couple of years and, and preaching changes overall, it's not so much about teaching. It's more about preaching as an art form, but teaching. You look, at the, you look at the preaching of Jesus, it's teaching, it's teaching, it's teaching. And so my preaching is more and more going to be teaching. We don't have that many teaching opportunities, do we, in a church this size? This is an opportunity to teach, and so I've never felt more strongly that preaching is teaching. Let's look at those predictions of Jesus' passion, those teachings of Jesus' passion. In the first one, back in chapter 8, this one happened in the context of Jesus asking the disciples, who do you guys say that, that I am? Who do, you, who do you think I am? And Peter stands up and he says, you are the Messiah. He got the word right. He was right about that. He got the definition wrong. Because right after Peter makes this confession, this declaration, Jesus makes this prediction of his death. He says the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem. He's going to be killed. And he's going to rise on the third day. And Peter steps up and says, Oh no, that's not what's going to happen. You are not going to Jerusalem to die. He rebukes Jesus. And Jesus rebukes him back and says, Get behind me, Satan. 
get behind me. You're trying to do exactly what the, the tempter was doing in the, in the wilderness to get me to take a shortcut from the cross. Get behind me, Satan. That was the context of the first teaching of his passion. The third one, that when we read along past chapter 9 today, when we get to chapter 10, in the third one, Jesus and the disciples are almost to Jerusalem. They're at the gate practically. And he makes this prediction. And they don't understand. Again, I got to go. I got to die. I got to rise again. They don't get it. What happens right after that? James and John, two of the disciples, the brothers, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. They come to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, we have a favor to ask. Yeah, what is it? When you come into your glory, let one of us sit on your right hand and the other on your left. <laughs> totally, totally misunderstand what's going on here. They're looking at where they are going to fit in the rankings. Who's going to be at your right hand? Who's going to be the top general? Can the other one of us sit on, on the other side? And Jesus says to them, fellas, can you really drink of the cup that I'm about to drink of? And he was speaking of his death. Can you really drink of that cup? Do you really think you can go with me, stay with me, one on your left and one on your right? And you think glory has certain connotations, but you know who ended up on the right and on the left of Jesus? Because Jesus' glory is the cross, and criminals ended up on the left and on the right on the cross. James and John weren't there. They weren't anywhere to be found. That was the third. The second prediction of his, of his passion, of his death, the teaching, comes in today's gospel. Jesus and the disciples are passing through Galilee. That's where Jesus was from. That's in the north. Jerusalem is to the south. They're making their way to Jerusalem for that last week, for that holy week. And did you notice the scripture says he didn't want anyone to know it. He didn't want anyone to know it. He's with these 12 guys. They're walking and talking and making their way to Jerusalem. And he didn't want anyone to know it. Why? For he was teaching his disciples. He was teaching his disciples. He needed to concentrate on them. When he's gone, they're going to have the responsibility. He's teaching them. It's critically important that they learn. And he says, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying. And they were afraid to ask. They said nothing. Now, before we're too harsh on these disciples, we would do the exact same thing. We would do the exact same thing. We have the benefit of hindsight. We know now that there are what we call theories of the atonement, these theories as to what exactly happened on the cross. What was it about Jesus' death that affected salvation or, or atonement? We have all that. They didn't. They didn't have any of that. All they had was the coming of the Messiah who is announcing a new kingdom who is going into Jerusalem to restore Israel, and Jesus is going to win. Jesus is going to win, right? Wouldn't we feel the same way? We're following this guy. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. We're going to follow this guy into Jerusalem. We're going to take over, and it's going to be a victory. We're going to win. We would think the very same thing. It's no wonder that they didn't understand, and they didn't understand at all. Then they enter Capernaum. They go into a house. And he asks them, guys, uh, what was it you were arguing about on the way? What were you guys talking about? But they were silent. Again, they didn't say anything. These guys have clammed up big time. Why? Because they were arguing with one another about who would be the greatest where are we going to rank? We know we're in the top 12, but how are you going to arrange the 12 of us? 
There will be a hierarchy, right? Who's going to be on the top? Who's going to be in the middle? Who's going to be at the bottom? We're all going to have high offices, but who's going to be at the top? Who's going to be the greatest? It is here that we need to talk about two competing systems. Two competing operating systems. The operating system of the kingdoms of the world and the operating system of the kingdom of God. The first one, the operating system of the world, is a climb to the top. It is a scratchy and clawing to the top. It is about status and it is about prestige and it is about recognition and it is about wealth and it is about influence. It's all about that, climbing to the top to become number one. That's what that operating system is about. It operated then, it operates now. That's the one operating system. Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo is a thing that operates in that first operating system. Remember last week we were talking about how it's difficult sometimes to understand what the Bible is saying and it goes over our heads sometimes and we almost have to conclude that you would need a master's degree in biblical study in order to even get an inkling of what the Bible is about. And then we said, wait a minute, how can that be? How could God, the God of the universe, the God of creation, make something so hard that we couldn't understand it? And we talked about the importance of just bathing all of that in prayer and in love and in serious Bible study, because that certainly opens things up, but about contemplative prayer, practicing the presence of God, listening for God, because the same God who spoke then speaks now. And so we can understand the Bible, given all of that. We talked about all that. And we talked about the problem of language, right? Remember, we talked about the fact that in order to understand the Bible, you need to know something about Hebrew, because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. You need to know something about uh, Greek, because the New Testament is written in Greek. But you know what we left out? Latin. Latin. There's another complicating factor for understanding the Word of God. Jesus, the church, uh, the Roman Empire. That was the language of the Roman Empire, Latin. And the church really took off from Rome, right? So Latin is important. And we, we've got some Latin. You might not think you know any, but we've incorporated it into, into our language. E pluribus unum. E pluribus unum. It's on our money. Out of many, one. It is our national motto, e pluribus unum, et cetera. We're writing a note, got a big long list going, you know, the point's been made, so you just go, et cetera, you know, et cetera. And the rest of such things. Mea culpa, mea culpa, that's Latin. Mea culpa means that's my fault. That's my fault. Or we might say, my bad, mea culpa, my, my bad. And even in, in the church, we can hear and we can see uh, some Latin that's incorporated into our, into our daily living. Back when we worshiped in a traditional fashion, there would be the doxology, right? The gloria patri, the, the gloria patri, the glory of the Father. On the west side of Evansville, there's a, a high school called Mater Dei. That's Latin, Mother of God. There's a city in Texas, Corpus Christi. Anybody been to Corpus Christi? I haven't either. You've been to Corpus Christi? That's Latin, the body of Christ. But this morning, I want to unpack this other Latin term a little bit. Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. It's really, uh, there's really nothing harmful or uh, devious or scandalous about quid pro quo. It happens everywhere, especially in business. Now, if it, if it approaches bribery, then yeah, that's questionable, but a quid pro quo means something for something. Something for something. When I stopped at McDonald's, I gave them, what did I give them, a dollar for a cup of coffee? Gave them a dollar, I got a cup of coffee. That's a quid pro quo, something for something. Any contract that you're in, your mortgage is a contract, it's a quid pro quo. They're gonna give you a house, title of the house, and you're going to make payments on it every month. That's something for something. Nothing really heinous about it until it gets out of hand. But quid pro quo is a thing that operates in that first operating system. And the disciples were subject to that quid pro quo. They wanted to know for the something that I'm putting into this, what's the something that I'm going to get out of it? If I'm going to put something into this, I'm certainly going to get something out of it. And what is it? Peter said that, that exact same thing. He went to Jesus and he said, Jesus, we, uh, listen, buddy, I left a career and a family and a house 
for you? What am I going to get? And what are we going to get? I gave something. What's the something that, that I'm going to get? James and John, we heard that story. <laughs> they wanted to be on the right or the left. didn't matter to them. They just knew they wanted one or two of the top positions. They wanted something for something, quid pro quo. They wanted it. The disciples in our gospel lesson today, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? We walked all this way with you to Jerusalem. We're going to win this big victory here in Jerusalem. We're going to renew Israel. What are we going to get for it? What are we going to get for it? For all that we've done, the something that we put into it. What's the something that we're going to get out of it? And then Jesus sat down. And in that culture, in that time, when it was time to teach, they sat down. When it's time for us to teach, we stand up. When it's time for a rabbi to teach, they sit down. And so Jesus hears these disciples who can't get it. They say, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? And I can only imagine that Jesus shook his head and he sat down to teach. To teach. One more time to teach. He sat down. He called the twelve and said to them, you want to be first? You want to be first? If you want to be first, you've got to be last. <laughs> if you want to be first, you've got to be last and servant of all. You think you want to be a general? You have to be a slave. If you want to be first, you've got to be last. You've got to serve. You've got to serve. You've got to serve. This is the other operating system. That's the operating system of the kingdom of God. Where the first one is that climb to the top, this one is a descent. That's a descent to the bottom, to the very bottom. It's a reversal. It's an upside down thing. And I just like to imagine they're in this house, it's the disciples, who else is there? Maybe other members of the family because there's a child there. Jesus is teaching and he's teaching and he's teaching and this, there's a child. And he sees, okay, here's, a, here's an object lesson right there in front of me. And he takes that child, that little child, takes it up in his arms. And he says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me quid pro quo something for something in that first operating system of the world of the religious leadership of Jesus's time of the leadership in Rome in our operating system today quid pro quo in this other operating system, it's not based on quid pro quo. It's not based on something for something. It's based on something for nothing. Something for nothing. This child has nothing to offer. Nothing. And that child is a stand-in for everyone who has nothing. And when we give of our resources expecting to get something back, it cannot happen when what we're giving is giving to someone with nothing, like a child or someone poor or someone sick. What we give is something for nothing. The word here that's operative is welcome. Welcome. Listen to the repetition of the word welcome in the words of Jesus. And repetition is important in Scripture. You see repetition? Pay attention. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. And the word welcome, it's related to another word that his first hearers and first readers, they would have connected to this word right away. 
And that word is hospitality. Hos hospitality. And that word, hospitality, is connected to other words that are connected to how we live our lives, like hospital, a place you go when you have nothing to offer and you go to get well. That's, ho that's hospital. Hostel, a place you stop on the way and you get rest. You get rest at a hostel. Hotel, same thing applies. You're on the road, you're tired. You stop at a hotel and you get rest. You get hospitality. Hospice, hospice. You got nothing. You got nothing to offer got nothing to offer but a hospice provides a place it gives to someone who has nothing to give in return hospice hospitality hotel hostel hospital hospitality this little child in the arms of Jesus has nothing to give nothing to give the disciples didn't get it they didn't get it they didn't get it within the pages of the gospel of Mark but here is the genius of Jesus, the absolute genius of Jesus and of Mark. You know they got it. You know they got it. You wouldn't be sitting here if they didn't get it. The book closed. The book closed with every single one of the disciples scattering, including the women. Remember in the Gospel of Mark, the women go to the tomb. They see the angel, and the angel says, he's not here. He said, he'll meet you in Galilee. Go tell, go tell the disciples that he'll meet them in Galilee. And those women left the tomb. They ran away afraid. And the Gospel of Mark closes. Everyone has abandoned Jesus. Everyone. Even God. And the only thing Jesus says on the cross in the Gospel of Mark is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Gospel of Mark closes. It closes. But, but. The first readers of the Gospel of Mark would have been reading this 30 or 40 years after these events. They would have known by experience. They're meeting, they're gathering, they're in a community because the, the disciples heard. Because the women must have at some point told the disciples. Jesus must have met them in Galilee. And Jesus did build his church on the rock that was Peter. But it happened after the Gospel of Mark closed. That's genius. That's brilliant. And when we read the Gospel of Mark today, that's a discovery that we are to make too and that we are to live. The disciples didn't get it because they had to live it. Their education wasn't complete. The teaching that Jesus was trying to give them, they didn't get it because it's not complete until it became a reality. And the death, the death and the resurrection of Jesus finally for the disciples enabled them to get it. This is what it means to be Messiah, not to take the high road, <laughs> to take that low road. That's what it means. And that's what it means for us. That's what will open it up for us when we realize that the point of the teaching is that this Messiah came not to gain that military victory. This Messiah came to die, to conquer evil, to conquer Satan, and then to be resurrected to eternal life. Give it a shot. Start from the beginning, go all the way to the end. So many things open up. So many things open up. And it's an easy read. It really is. And then next month we can tackle Matthew. Would you pray with me?
And as we pray, let's meditate on what we, what we know in our hearts. That while the, the book of Mark closed on the misunderstanding of the disciples, really wasn't the end of the story. It was only the beginning of the story. And we know because the Spirit lives among us and within us. And so the Savior who died lives. And we don't understand how death becomes a victory. We, like the disciples, are afraid. They had, no, they had zero faith. They had no faith. They had only fear. So as we meditate on this, let's allow these words that are in our brains to move into our hearts. to take up residence there, to transform us from the inside out. And may that word then proceed from us so that others might understand. And let us pray with the psalmist to Pray these words, and you can repeat these after me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Amen. Time now for our tithes and offerings. And there are several ways you can do that. As always, the purple buckets are at the entrance to the sanctuary. One of those buckets is for the general fund. One is for the, for the building fund. Uh, you can uh, mail in your, your tithes and offerings to post office box 156 in Boonville. Or you can give online as well. So as you consider the many gifts uh, that God has given you and the gifts that you return to God, let's have a song. As I wandered through the pilgrim land, there is a friend who walked with me. Lead me safely through the sinking sand, is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer to Lord each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy life to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea. Yeah. 
pray. Gracious God, all that we have is yours. We just hold it in trust for you. Lord, we return a portion of it back to you. May it be used to advance your kingdom right here on earth. Amen. This is the table of the Lord, and the invitation to the table is not my invitation. It's not my invitation to give. The invitation is the invitation of Jesus himself. And Jesus' invitation is to everyone, and that means everyone. Uh, that includes children. And so sometimes parents like to wait, and that's okay, but just know that children uh, are welcome at the Lord's table uh, for this holy meal. But before we uh, commune, uh, let's confess. And so with me, would you bow your heads and close your, your eyes, and in the silence before God, confess your sin. Lift your heads and open your eyes and hear the very, very, very good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinning. This proves his great love for us. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. We will commune together with these all-in-one cups, and so you can uh, follow my lead, okay? Jesus not so long after the events described in the sermon today, not so long after he made that third prediction of his death and entered Jerusalem, not so long after that, it was Thursday night of that, of that holy week, and he had that meal. He had that special meal with those guys that we've been talking about. And after the meal was over, he... He took the bread and he broke it 
And he gave thanks. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. After the supper was over, he took the cup. And he said, take and drink. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins for many. As often as you drink it, remember me. Would you stand if you're able and let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may remain standing or you may be seated. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful for the word, the written word, and the word in action. And it is in those loving actions that we come to understand better than we understood before. Owning the fact that your son died and that you brought him back to life and that he reigns with you. Dad loving action helps us understand. And this meal this meal where we take in the very presence of the living Jesus helps remove the scales from our eyes as well. And so we thank you for this meal. May we be nourished by it. May we be strengthened by it. That we might carry this word through our own actions beyond these walls. Amen. Would you please stand with us? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion my constant friend is he his eye is on the sparrow and I know His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me, and I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free.
your heart be troubled is tender words I hear and resting on his goodness I lose my doubt and fear oh by the path he leadeth one step by His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because. Thank you so much for worshiping with us through the live stream. Maybe someday you can join us in person. In fact, our service is continuing even right now. We are in a time of prayer when we're sharing with one another our joys and, and our concerns. Of course, we don't want to share those through the live stream out of respect for the privacy issues that are involved. But if you'd like to share a prayer request, you can do that through email. Just email your request to prayers at bakerchapelumc.com. And if you'd like to see the other prayer requests and you're not already on our mailing list, just add your email address. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Continue to follow us here on Facebook, on YouTube, and at our webpage. And now receive the blessing. The love of God, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and stay with you all the time. Amen.